Well, tonight, the new CJ nominee, the politics is law and the potential for reform. There's a lot of controversy surrounding this already that we're trying to break it down for you tonight. Um, Justice Ininyabwa is possibly Ghana's I mean, new CJ. That is, if he crosses a vet vetting, uh, Parliament will have to approve him. Now, uh, if approved, Justice Ininyabwa, who is the fourth longest serving justice of the Supreme Court, will secede. Uh, Justice Sophia Kufu and her term expires shortly. Now, the minority and majority members in parliament seem to be divided on the nomination. They say they are not actually divided on his person, but just a procedure leading to the vetting of, of, of the nominee in question. Whilst majority lords the president's decision, the uh, minority have served notice of boycotting the vetting of this nominee. And this is all about rushing it or not rushing it they 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 are accusing the uh, colleagues on the other side of rushing the process to approve the nominee something the minority guys are vehemently opposed to now justice in india but was first appointed by uh jonah for in 2008 very important to observe that he has also served as a justice of the high court and the court of appeal and in addition he is a part-time lecturer in civil procedure at the Ghana School of Law, the he. My guest in the studio uh, is uh, Mr. Kofi Abuchi. He is a private legal practitioner, former dean of the uh, Gimpa Law School. Uh, grateful uh, that you could join me again on the set. Uh, he is uh, a good friend of this particular show. He, anytime he gets here, he comes on the show, you know that the subject is big enough. Uh, he will invite him when the subject is this big, and I'm grateful that he joined me. Uh, also joining me is a man who also does the same, actually, when, when the thing is boiling in Parliament and you need somebody to break it down for you. You get Inusa Fuseni, and uh, he's. I'm just telling him that uh, we need to uh, use him quite adequately because uh, in, in in 12 months' time we won't have him again as a ranking on the Constitutional Legal Affairs Committee in Parliament, and so this is the time to curate part of that uh, knowledge he has. Uh, sitting in that uh, nice head of theirs, and so we are grateful to host you again. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for joining me. Thank this you. is is somehow become a very controversial matter. Never saw it this coming this way. I thought this was going to be another vetting, a normal vetting, but they're turning out not to be so at all. Fundamentally, there's a statement tonight from the minority side um, formalizing the, uh, your decision to boycott the process, the vetting process, if the majority side insists on rushing it through and uh, doing it on the 21st. Why is that procedure so important to the minority that you're willing to boycott the pro whole process over? Uh, so, uh, let me say good morning to my good friend, uh, uh, Ernest Awochi, yeah. and to say that, well, we miss your voice on the Radio Universe. <laughs> uh, oh, you were Radio Universe? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a long story. Long story. It's, it's a long story. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm interested later on. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, uh, coming back to your question, I think basically what has happened probably is some misunderstanding of the communications between the various members of the appointments committee and the real intent of what the first deputy speaker sought to do. In law, we call it abridgment of time. Normally, when uh, a president nominates uh, a person for a position which requires the intervention of parliament to confirm the appointment by vetting, the parliament normally gives two weeks notice to the public to bring in memoranda to assist in the vetting. So you will have uh, members of the public participating indirectly in the vetting by sending memoranda to the members of the committee so that the, the nominee can be vetted, asked questions 
on what the public perceives of that member. And so it's a two-week two -week period that is normally given. And mm -hmm. since I came to Parliament, this is what has always been given, two weeks. Now, because Parliament is going to rise on the 21st, mm. which is Saturday, next week, I mean, this week's Saturday, yeah. I mean, it appears that there might not be enough opportunity for the uh, the uh, advertisement in the papers requesting for a memoranda from the public concerning the nominee uh, to be for a two-week period. And so uh, I understand that both the minority and the majority in principle mm -hmm. agreed to a one-week advertisement in the, in, the, in the newspapers and to determine when the actual vetting will take place after the expiration of the one week. Mm. Now, so you have different, that is where the, there's a divergence. Yeah. Now, you have the minority saying that because uh, uh, the first deputy speaker calls to be published in the uh, newspapers, is rushing the process in the in ensuring that in trying to ensure that the vetting is done and the speaker the the nominee approved or disapproved in parliament on the twenty first. That's the day parliament will be rising. And if parliament so carries out its responsibility under this duality of uh, 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 approval uh, approval process. Then it, Parliament would, 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 have, would have completed its work. Okay, and then it will be left with the executive. The executive can decide on that very day uh, to uh, swear him into office or mm -hmm. wait until the next Monday to swear him into office. Now, the minority is saying that, no, you see, because we gave two weeks and we, we gave one week, why don't we meet after the expiration of the one week and settle on a day? that will do the vetting. That would mean that they will miss the 21st day, the 21st uh, December date, and Parliament will be on recess. So it will necessarily require that Parliament be called back to do the vetting and then the consequential approval. Okay? And, 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 and that's, that is where the difference is. And I, I don't think that it's beyond reconciliation. I don't think that because members on the committee are members who have distinguished themselves in various fields of endeavor. Most of them are senior members of parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, they should be able to sit down and agree on what they want to do with the nominee. I have said that uh, my advice to them was that we should not be seen as objecting to the vetting of the nominee or opposing the timetable that has been put forth by the first deputy speaker. I thought that there's every opportunity to build consensus on what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now the, the, the controversy is sort of about when to do this? The controversy is about ego. Okay. It, it's egoistic. I mean, two people simply thinking that this is not I will, will not, I will not agree to the proposal. When you say two are, people, you mean who uh, the, who? The, the speaker, the first deputy speaker, and the uh, uh, first, I mean the, the minority chief whip. Mm -hmm. I mean, just simply thinking that, well, if you want to first on us the the deadline for uh, vetting the nominee, we will resist that, and because we are not pawns, we are also the minority. We have constituencies, and we are in Parliament on our own right, mm. and we have to hold you in check. In any case, why do you think that we should abridge the time? You have not sufficiently explained to us why we should abridge the time. But I thought, I thought that, I mean, there should be a way out of this matter. Okay. I mean, Mr. Bochy, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, isn't it, that um, such a, an important position as a Chief Justice of the Republic be, I, I wonder what any of will be thinking right now. He's been left in a very difficult place. No, correct. <coughs> Regrettably, forgive my voice. I am under a little bit of cold, so uh, if my voice is coarse, I apologize. Uh, now, you, you absolutely stated it right. I think the point is the 
uh, Chief Justice Nomili will find himself in quite an uncomfortable position at this stage. It's important for us to understand the structure of our government. We have two political branches, and the two political branches are the executive and the legislature. And then we have one non-political branch. That non-political branch is the judiciary. Uh, judges are trained to stay out of conflict, to stay away from conflict, and that's what he's done all his life or tried to do as a judge. And so to find himself in the middle of uh, growing conflict uh, in terms of the body that is supposed to do the vetting, I can imagine that he, he probably be feeling a bit uncomfortable. But at this stage, because he has not been invited, or I'm not sure added whether he has at this stage, but because he has not presented himself yet, he is still pretty much on the sidelines. And so he can remain quiet, but as far as uh, he's concerned, and I can imagine, I'm sure that he wouldn't want to be remembered yeah. as the Chief Justice when he's finally confirmed. He wouldn't want to be remembered as, as the Chief Justice whose uh, nomination um, and indeed impending uh, vetting created so much political acrimony in Parliament, uh, particularly when you have one party walking away. And hopefully that doesn't happen. It's important for us to understand that bipartisanship, particularly in the vetting of a chief justice who is not, who is not a political actor, is important not only for the richness of the process, but also, it's also important to demonstrate the nonpartisan character of the institution for which he's actually been vetted as chief justice. And that's part of the reason I suspect that he may be, um, hopefully, he may be a bit uncomfortable and is hoping somehow that at this stage we can uh, this can be resolved so that he is not remembered for the antecedents of his veteran, which ultimately may, have, may, may lead to his uh, approval as Chief Justice. Uh, it's important, and I think my, my colleague here mentioned that, it's important that somehow the leadership of Parliament is able to work this together. Now, the Supreme Court itself, and that's rather interesting, the Supreme Court itself, in its previous jurisprudence, has indicated that Parliament is a master of its own. Um, its own internal rules and its own internal happiness. Now, in that respect, what it means is that nobody can tell Parliament how to go about its business. If Parliament therefore decides that they are going to hold the vetting today, nobody can tell Parliament that it should not hold the vetting on a particular day. So, if Parliament has decided, as it has, um, in accordance with its own leadership and in accordance with its own internal rules and regulations, it's only Parliament that can change that. And again, so the parliament does not, this, this appears not to be consensus around when to do this. I mean, that, they, that's, the, that's, that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty. I mean, if you listen to Joe Sousu, and thankfully he joins us on the line. Um, Mr. Joe Sousu, thank you very much for your time here on PM Express. Hello, Mr. Joe Sousu. Yes, good evening. Good sir. evening. Thank you very much for your time here on PM Express. Uh, I have with me in the studio uh, Kofi Abuchi and also Inusa Fuseni. Inusa Fuseni had said at the beginning that he believes this is an, a matter that can easily be resolved and that, um, Inusa, you're not even opposed to the 21st Saturday vetting, are you? You're not opposed to the, to the no, Saturday? No, no, opposed, no, no, opposed. I mean, he's not opposed to the Saturday vetting. They believe this can easily be resolved. I, I, is that your view too? Well, frankly, if the majority wanted to dictate the pace or direct what's supposed to do without a, de a decision of the committee. I wouldn't have called the meeting of the majority uh, of the committee. I called the meeting of the committee. We discussed various scenarios. And I'm emphasizing that the position that was advertised by the class is the position that was proposed by the minority leader. I proposed that we advertise up to Wednesday and do the vetting on the Thursday so that we'll be able to file the report with uh, the, the plenary on the Saturday of which Parliament was supposed to adjourn, which was the 21st. That was not agreed to. The majority leader came in. He proposed that why don't you advertise up to Thursday, uh, do the public hearing, the vetting on Friday, so that you bring us the report, uh, the report to the plenary on on the Saturday. That was also not agreed to. 
then rather the minority leader proposed that let's do the advert for the whole of the week up to Friday. Let's do the betting itself on Saturday. And let's extend the sitting of Parliament to the Monday after. Nobody else, apart from the minority leader, made this suggestion. It was upon agreeing to that that the meeting came to a conclusion. And then the, uh, uh, the clerk went ahead to go and issue the notice. I didn't have to tell him anything further because he was part of the discussion. The agreement was reached in his person. So I'm so disappointed that the minority turns around to accuse me in particular of rushing the process and um, seeking favor, or is it, what do they say? I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing um, procedure or whatever for familiarity. It is very, very uh, disheartening. I was just reading uh, the, the statement when your call came through. But let me put it on record that the standing order of Parliament that we work with does not say anywhere that we should advertise for any particular number of days. It is the exigencies of the situation that informs what number of days we advertise. And I'm sure if you search, you find that we have never had a one uniform. We have preferred if uh, or need be, we will do it for two weeks. We've never exceeded two weeks. But there are several occasions that we have advertised for less than two weeks. And I'll give you one example. For those of you who remember the vetting of the vice, vice president mm. when he was nominated by the former president. How many days did we advertise before we did the vetting? I think it was two days or so, three days. So let it not appear that there's something onto what being done because. And let me say this. I've been a member of the appointment committee since I, I joined parliament. There was not a single occasion before I became the chair of the committee that the committee had been called to discuss the modalities and the time. It was always fixed by the chairman of the committee. Always. But since I became the chairman of the appointment committee, I always call a meeting of the committee to discuss the modalities and agree on the time and, and arrangement for betting. Mm. At times, we have agreed and changed the, the mode and procedure. I'm not a dictator. I believe strongly in um, consensus building. But in this current situation, the minority appears to be saying that if you don't agree to the way we want it, then it is not consensus. Mm. That, I think, is turning democracy uh, head down. Democracy air to try to reach a consensus. If you cannot agree on a consensus, the decision of the majority is the decision yes. of the whole. Mm. And I, I, I pray we all respect that. Exactly. Now, I'm just coming to just a final point about so where we are, it appears there's an impasse, but I know. Minority guys have, you know, majority, majority, minority, majority, you faced worse, you know, instances and found common grounds. On this very important subject of vetting and approval, do you, how, do you hope at least, and is there any active moves currently to try, in, the, in spite of the challenges and the controversy, find some middle ground, I'm agree it. when to do I'm, this? I'm, I cannot help but come to the conclusion that the controversy is contrived. Mm. Otherwise, we can't go to a meeting, reach decisions, propose a minority leader, accepted by the group, and then it turns around to be the majority is accused of rushing the process. And then, now, the prayer statement was issued by the minority chief group on Saturday. Mm. I was at the funeral at the time when Joy News called me. That the minority leader has issued a statement. Oh, sorry, the minority chief whip yeah. had issued a statement yeah. that um, the minority would not participate in the yeah. uh, vetting process. And I was surprised. They called me and said, "They say you are rushing the process." And no, it cannot be. 
the advert is entirely based on the proposal by the minority leader. It was accepted. You know, so for them to turn around and accuse us of rushing the process is appears to me is, is to be contrived. Is, is, is there any way out of is there any way out of is there any way out of this? From what you say? I don't know what else. Parliament certain time has been amended to accommodate your situation. As I was uh, openly admitted, even my own desire, I would have wished that we work within the Parliament's program. Mm. So we would have done the vetting Saturday, or the majority leader's program would have done the vetting on, uh, on Friday. Either way, we would have presented the report to the uh, plenary on Saturday, mm. on the date on which Parliament. Uh, as a program to rise. But we all deferred to the proposal by the Manuel Sibica and agreed to extend certain to the following uh, certain day, which is the Monday. Mm. So I don't know what else we can do, and we have already put that advert out. Okay. You know, so I don't think it's fair to reverse it to the other parties and take over. Okay. Right. But very finally, the, the, the Sam and the minority have also suggested this in the statement that because of your close uh, affiliation, friendship, really, with the nominee, you should recuse yourself from the process. What do you, what's your reaction to that? Which process are they talking I mean, the, about? the vetting. The process the, the vetting. of deciding, the taking decisions of the committee. Should I cease to be the chairman of the committee? I mean, just for or? this particular nominee. Why? Because they For those of you who have monitored all the vetting, how many times have you seen the chairman ask the question? I only moderate. Haruna can ask 20, 30 questions. Muntaka can ask 20, 30 questions. I only come in when there's something not clear and ask it when you need to clarify it. So that is not a difficult thing to do at all. But I think there must be a justifiable ground. Mm. Yes, I and Justice Eni Abua used to practice from the same chambers. But I left the chamber in 1993, 16 years ago. That's when I left Kofobia and started practicing Kumasi. We have retained, remained friends. Is that sufficient to say that anybody who is a friend of the person cannot preside over? Hmm. I mean, there are judicial decisions in that respect, and I encourage you to research that. Hmm. I notice that Professor Buchi is. Okay. What is the judicial principle? What did the judges say when it was alleged that one judge knew somebody else? You know. So I am not worried at all. Nobody knows what my plan is at the mm. time at the, when it comes to uh, the process itself. Okay. But for now, I see very clearly a contrived effort to generate controversy when there is no basis for it. I am grateful that you joined me. Uh, Mr. Abuchi, what's your comment on, on what he said? It appears clearly from what he said that the Saturday one, he says he can't, he doesn't see the reason to reverse it. And then the substantive matter, he mentioned your name because he says <laughs> you have no precedent about his, he's confirmed, yes, I worked in this chamber, he's my friend, but I, I don't think I should recuse him. He hasn't seen justification. What, what's your comment on those two things? Well, if you take the first one first, and if you're applying it strictly from the standpoint of you know, judicial decisions, then the standard is not met. Um, for a judge, if he sits in the position as a judge, and in this case it's ancillary to that, um, you must demonstrate a real case of bias, and not just a real case of bias, but a real likelihood of bias. Now, that standard is quite high, and so even if you're friends with someone, um, even if you were seen on, the, you know, there's a famous case in Ghana in which the allegation was that a judge was seen with um, a party who is supposed to be a party in a matter appearing before that judge. The judge was seen at the famous um, is it Continental Hotel, they used to call it Golden Chili, mm -hmm. uh, drinking beer uh, the night before. And there was an allegation <laughs> that by reason of that, you know, the case has been decided on the beer table. Uh, the court decided that you must demonstrate a real likelihood of bias. Now, the reason for this is we're a small country. And so there are connections, there are networks, there are relationships. If you set a small and a low bar for considerations of bias and considerations of uh, you know, uh, uh, preferences, you are likely not to have any judge sitting on any case because everyone is connected to everyone somehow. So you are either my church member or you live in my area 
or my daughter is your son's friend, you know, you can have all kinds of connections. And because of that, you may potentially undermine all kinds of cases in which there's actually no bias. So if you should apply the judicial standard, then of course this is not met. Um, I guess I'm sure there are those who may probably hold a contrary opinion that the judicial standard should not be held and that the, may be the political standard. And that political standard could be one of perception. Mm -hmm. And in, in, the, in the spectrum of the political standard, one doesn't really care about the rationality of the suspicion. People be, be, may, may merely restrict themselves to the suspicion per se that there's a case of suspicion that you may have worked together, you may have a certain close proximity, and therefore um, you can't be expected to be, uh, to be neutral or not to be biased. But this is not a strictly speaking judicial proceeding. And so I, I guess maybe we can give the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. that, you know, like he indicated, the chairman probably just sits in, a, in an administrative position in which he moderates the process and ensures that questions are asked, ensures that there's a certain fairness that goes around, and in the end, the chairman doesn't pass a verdict. Um, the committee the must committee come does. to a decision. So, in reality, the extent of his powers are not as high as, as, as the judicial proceeding. But then the first um, issue, I think about the question of um, the bad faith and whether it can be held on, yeah. you know, the on Saturday. I Saturday think Saturday. what I suspected, and listening to the chairman, what I suspected is there appears to be a case of serious suspicion of bad faith. Yeah. I think there's a suspicion of bad faith from his side against the minority. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the minority side, then there's a consideration of a suspicion of the majority trying to bulldoze his way through. I have a feeling that they can still save the process. There should be a lot of back-channel considerations and back-channel communication that can happen among the leadership of parliament in order to ensure consensus I will implore, uh, particularly the chairman, that in this respect, I think consideration should be given to the nominee. Because there's a danger sometimes, mm. if you're not careful, that the collateral damage then becomes a nominee. Absolutely. Who unfortunately has nothing to do with what's going on. Yeah. He's a judge, he's been a lawyer, he is a judicial person, he has nothing to do with the politics. But the proverbial two elephants fighting, and then he's standing on the fringes, he just wants to appear and answer any question. <laughs> just go any question anybody fight. has, he's ready to yeah. appear and answer the question. But he may just become a collateral damage within the purview of the political fight, infighting, backbiting between the two sides. And it may be embarrassment, if you like, embarrassment to him, yeah. given the standing that he has and the position that he's actually And the danger if to. he is vetted and approved only by the majority side. That then is it, even more Then it creates, right? more, it creates more optical deficits. Yeah. You know? So those are some of the things that I have a feeling that the majority may still want to consider the question of back-channel consultations for bipartisanship, uh, for bipartisan uh, consensus. I think this can still be built. The majority may be brought to the table to come on Saturday. On the other hand, sorry, the minority may be brought to the table to maybe convinced to come on the table on Saturday. On the other hand, the majority may find wisdom or some kind of conviction in deciding to probably, you know, move move the time a little bit, even if not to exactly what the majority are asking, but to some middle of the ground um, timing that may actually fit both sides. But I think consensus is important because this is not a political position, mm -hmm. and the danger that the nominee may be stampeded and, as it were, be embarrassed by all these political infighting, and eventually he has to appear. He has to appear when called, and the question is. What audience is he going to get? Is he going to receive a one-sided audience? Mm. Or he's going to receive an audience which is reflective of parliament? And for him, he's prepared to answer any question. But somehow, he finds himself stampeded by the political um, infighting and the heat around him. And as I said, mm. it can be a barrage. So I suspect that with it, between now and Saturday, I it suspect can be that the process can still be salvaged. And I think it will be to the benefit of the time. Well, so you had the chairman there. Uh, your comments on that. So we can go well, into... Let me speak directly to the chairman. Yeah. And I think because his chairman is a leader, yeah. and he must endeavor to carry all his people along with him. I agree with uh, Mr. Abuchi when he says that the, the process is not foreclosed. And the participation of the minority cannot be, I mean, must still be entertained. I mean, and, and we have enough time to be able to do that. I mean... Tomorrow we are not meeting, but tomorrow Parliament, Parliamentary Service will still be working. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there will, be, there will be people who clearly will be in Parliament to explore the possibility of give, getting the minority onto the table. I mean, what we are doing is it, it's a fight between the mi minority and the majority. But if we don't take time to spill, spill over to the uh, nominee, and we all agree we are unanimous that 
uh, this thing is not about the nominee, it's about the processes. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, we shouldn't mar the beauty of a vetting yeah. process uh, of the nominee to, to by our infighting. And yeah. I, I believe that it is indeed true that the uh, minority leader suggested some days which was agreeable to the committee and which was the reason why the adverts were placed. I mean, they could, they could talk about this matter and, and find a, a, a compromise solution mm -hmm. uh, to the issue. But you risk creating a public's mind, the perception that you are opposed to him. That's the problem. I mean, people can struggle to dis make the distinction. You know, that, that is a that, major that risk. That is the problem. And, 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 yeah. and this is a political process. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what they are even bringing in, up in yeah. conflict because it's a political process. And any time that, the, because of the, the governance architecture that we have, any time that a sitting president makes a I mean, so for saying, no, you actually started this controversy. No, no, no. You, 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 you first raise a point yeah. that you don't believe he is the man now for the chief justice position. No, no, that I, Jones Doce is most senior to him and that he deserves it. In fact, you even brought in his regional origins as a, as a, as, as a decider well, the, when they are both equally qualified. I was arguing on the basis of fairness and equity, mm. the justice of the matter, not on the competence of the various persons I mentioned. You're right. In fact, I said they are both equally competent. competent, and so there must be something no, no, that so divides the, them. Divides them. Yeah. And you think that before... So I, I thought that... Both the is underrepresented. No, 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 no. I thought that the president has exercised his discretion unfairly. Okay, explain that. Because uh, I'm aware that uh, when Justice Sophia Kofu was being considered, Justice Duchess' name came up forcefully. And I'm also aware that he was prevailed upon to, to give... I mean, they give uh, Sofia Kufu the opportunity because Sofia Kufu would retire from the Supreme Court before him. So I just thought that if that was the case, and now the opportunity had come back, they should be given the first uh, option. And, but on, on the basis of competence, I, I, I have appeared before Duce, I've appeared before Enigbe I've appeared before Duce when he was actually a high court judge. I've appeared before him too. Yes. In his chambers. Yes. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, I got, into, I got having, into trouble with him. A, a divorce, a divorce I, no, I, got, <laughs> I got into trouble with him and he spotted me and summoned me into his chambers. It was a fearful, fearful yeah, so, moment indeed for me. So I know I know the competence level. I know Adim Yeboah. I have no doubt in his ability to uh, be the head of the judicial service. And I have nothing against him. I was just thinking on the basis of you see, when two people are equally circumstance, you have to go beyond their competence to see whether you can satisfy some other interests. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was the basis of my argument. And now that the president, and I, my disappointment cannot reverse the decision that the president, <laughs> the has, the, the president has taken. But he has so, your vote when it comes to the plenary. Yes. Okay. Yes, I don't have a problem. Uh, Mr. Bochy, you know him? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Those who don't know him, and that's why we brought you here for the mere mortals like us. <laughs> why is he the best suited candidate for this particular position? I think that he is an exemplary judge. I think he has demonstrated a certain level of experience as a judge. To be a chief justice, you must have two hats. And your first heart is that you must be a judge and a justice of the Supreme Court as such. Now, in that respect, you must have demonstrated a certain appreciation of the law over the years. Your jurisprudence must show. And that's why consistently, when it comes to the issue of the vetting of chief justices, their jurisprudence normally is one of the key questions. In fact, not just chief justices, but ju Supreme Court judges in general. But chief justices in particular, because you must have a certain disposition towards the law, yeah. and that disposition towards the law must be appreciate, appreciated by not only yourself and you know, junior judges, but by your peers. So your depth of knowledge of the law must be appreciable. Now, in this particular respect, it's even more important because you invariably will lead the panels when you are sitting, unless you defer. So the Chief Justice must chair the proceedings when he's sitting, when he's panel. And in that respect, um, invariably, in, in many cases, he must either write the lead judgment or he defers to somebody else to actually do that. So your appreciation of the law must be 
must be significant to the extent to which you know your colleagues would not only respect your position of the law but can be uh, put along in terms of persuasion from the other side you are an administrator mm. so you are an administrator in chief as far as the judiciary is concerned now in this respect you are a peer manager so both a peer manager and a manager you know a regular manager as a peer manager you are managing all the judges a good number of them of which are your peers so you have the supreme court judges these are your peers but you are a primus inter paris in which case you're actually managing justices of the supreme court who are equally qualified and who are equally circumstanced just like you but you're also managing the judiciary as a whole now we all understand the complexity of managing the judiciary in light of you know certain revelations that um, we were all privy to, mm. you know, a few years ago, but of course, which were not necessarily surprising. People knew about them, except that they were this time exposed on, on camera. Judicial reform has been ongoing for some time, and I dare say that progress has been very slow. So, to be a chief justice, one has to have an appreciation of the depth and complexity of the challenges that confront the judiciary, but beyond that, must have a certain panacea by way of reform, by way of um, you know, management solutions to overcome some of these things. I think that Justice Eni Yeboah has been in the judiciary for such a long period of time to be able to appreciate the, the depth of issues that confront the judiciary. But in addition to that, um, again, my own knowledge of him, I have had the privilege of serving with him on a few committees now and then, and I've had the opportunity of interacting with him on many occasions, a very close range. I think he has a certain sense of how things ought to be. In that respect, I see Justice Eni Yeboah as an incoming Chief Justice when approved to be someone who will be reform-minded. Mm. Reform-minded in terms of how certain things should be changed. But I think the interesting thing about Justice Eni Yeboah, and I have, to be, I have to say this from my own personal knowledge, knowledge of him, I think the interesting thing about Justice Eni Yeboah in this respect has to do with the fact that he combines both a, a, a fair degree of pragmatic what I would say, pragmatic conservatism. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a conservative to a point. Mm -hmm. And then he has a certain degree of reform-mindedness. Mm -hmm. Which one is he more of? Which is the interesting part. And if you ask <laughs> me, that's a difficult one to tell. Because <laughs> Justice Eliyabua believes in how some things should not change. Okay. And I don't think I'm going to mention one or two of these. But how some things have to be the way they are. Mm -hmm. And how a certain degree... Okay, I can mention one, maybe one broad one mm -hmm. with a certain degree of comfort. And that has to do with, you know, if you like, judicial comportment. If you like, practice comportment, how lawyers should comport themselves, how lawyers should behave before judges, how lawyers should conduct their cases, how issues of legal discipline should be handled. And in this respect, he's, I think, currently the chairman of the disciplinary committee of the General Legal mm, Council. Mm. It is not surprising. And it demonstrates his belief in how a certain degree of professional propriety okay. should be upheld. Um, but on the other hand, he believes, for example, that a number of things must change. Um, you, know, you know, things about legal ed education, for example. And amazingly, he constantly, whatever he talks to me, he always tells me that he, one thing he finds, um, one big deficit he finds in Ghana's legal practice and judicial practice is the extent to which legal academia contributes very little to judicial decision making. Mm. Now, I find that very interesting because often many judges shy away from that. Many judges you know, appear to be comfortable with, because the thing about academic relationship with courts all over the world is that it's often built on critique. Yeah. We listen to judgment and then we critique the judgment. Now, judges often are very comfortable with the power hierarchy and power hierarchy means admit what judges have done and as lawyers will often say, the law is in the bosom of the judge. Mm -hmm. You don't ask too many questions, you don't criticize among others, but academics have a tendency to be critical of judicial decision making and sometimes tearing things to shred. So I find it interesting, particularly when it comes to He welcomes him, that. That not only does he welcome that, he critiques academia for being quiet. I see. And he's constantly asking, when are you going to write the articles to critique, not only critique, but actually comment on, on judicial decision making. Now this demonstrates one thing. It demonstrates a certain degree of progressivism on the part of the judge mm. at that level. That he doesn't, want, he doesn't want the decisions that they give to be static. But he wants the opinion and commentary of legal academics, which should feed into the quality of future decision making. And that's why I think he combines the two aspects of pragmatic conservatism, that some things must remain the way they are. 
and the fact that some other things must change and change quickly because circumstances and situations in where, which we have currently are not that satisfactory. So I think it'd be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see um, him confirmed, and um, maybe the position would be interesting. Mr. Fuseni, that is a big question for you, uh, and of course you're a politician. I want to ask you this first before you go into your legal understanding of who he is and what he represents in law. Any time a CGA is appointed nominator, people look at what is his record on some of the politically charged issues. You know what I mean? Yes. What's, I don't know if that analysis has been done already. And well, it's been done that. and we know where he stands. And that's where as I agree with uh, uh, Ernest that the jurisprudence of a judge matters in appointment because there's, there's the need for the de democratization of the Supreme Court. Mm. The Supreme Court is a representative of the people and all shades of opinion must appear on the Supreme Court. That's why in the last, just this uh, recent vetting we did of the nominees, uh, I asked one of the nominees whether it was time for us to know where the judges stood mm. on matters. Oh, you did? We need, yes, we need to, we need the, that's why in, in the American jurisprudence. It's so obvious. It's so obvious yeah. because you need to democratize the Supreme Court. The judges must be representing his op opinion. Can you imagine if all the judges are libertarians? Mm -hmm. what, what will happen? Yeah. Or they are they are they are social social I mean socialist inclined. Mm. What will happen no. to judgments? And so we, you need to democratize. And I agree entirely with you. Not on the pragmatism. I I I don't think that he's a pragmatist to the extent that he will imbibe certain philosophical philosophical underpinnings in when you read his judgments, you don't get a balanced pragmatist view of his of his <laughs> what are you struggling to say? How, Just say how it. the world should, should move, and that is that is that is funding the suspicion yeah. among certain quarters of that, our society that that well he has some sort of liberal <laughs> philosophical <laughs> underpinning that might not be totally representative of the people, and that that liberal underpinning might cloud his appreciation of issues. I mean, and and, and this is very forceful in the in the in the public domain. <laughs> Especially in view of the fact that p some people think that he doesn't represent their aspirations. Okay. Of which group is that? Of some people. <laughs> 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 yes, this is interesting. <laughs> You're behaving like a true lawyer. <laughs> well, choosing, your word, choosing your words carefully. I, I'm, I'm one. I but, know. But, but what, what I, I, I get what you're saying. Though, yes, yes, you get what I'm the saying. Listeners, yes, yes. The listeners reading between the lines and listening yes. know what you're saying. Yes, exactly. So, so let's leave it there. Uh, so we leave it there. I don't want to be a naughty boy tonight because no, I want to no, so push there. you to be so more So we leave clarity. it there. <laughs> but I agree to the extent that he's a fine gentleman. His appreciation of the law is solid. He will reach out if you are not prepared before him in court. He will let you understand that you are not prepared. And if you are trying to lead the court astray, he will bring you back on track. And he's very forceful at that. I mean, he won't wait until you finish. He will inter interrupt you. So, so, so that, that much I know. I know. Except that I agree, Abuchi, we should begin to push a campaign to democratize the Supreme Court. Because as is presently constituted, I don't think that the Supreme Court is very representative of the different shades of views mm. in our society. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure you agree with me <laughs> because I haven't actually said that about <laughs> the democratization of the Supreme Court. I think it's an interesting point. Yes. Look, first of all, yeah. we should begin maybe asking questions about some of the things that he's saying, whether democratizing the Supreme Court itself is an ideal. Um, in, from the standpoint of constitutional law, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Some people have even asked whether judges should be concerned about public outrage to their decision making. Yeah. Whether judges should consider the consequences of their decision making. In American jurisprudence, they call that consequentialism. Mm -hmm. Whether we should be concerned that a decision given to the East or the West may provoke certain public reactions and cause all kinds of things. Or whether judges should only stick to the key question. What does the law the say thing. on this? Yes, and I do not care what the outcome is. Mm. These are controversial issues. Now, over the years, and that's the question he's asking, I've had the privilege, actually, of having conversation with some respectable um, you know, judges over the years. I, I, you know, I can mention, for example, Justice uh, Databa, the former uh, respectable Justice Databa on this question, in which uh, I, I had you know, a private conversation with him on whether or not 
the judges in Ghana should identify, Supreme Court judges should identify with certain principled ideologies. But the difficulty for Ghanaian judges is American judges in particular, which is normally the contrast, you know, it's a world away, but sometimes we do all this contrast. But American judges would have a principled position on the basis of either you're a conservative or you're a liberal. It's ideological. But we tend to have difficulties in Ghana because we don't normally in our politics deal with the issue of conservatism and liberalism. We deal with the NDC and PP. That's it. And that's always the problem. Yeah. So when I used to teach constitutional law in KNU, I used to ask my students this experimental question. Uh, when judges are nominated, to just basically tell me where they think uh, you know, a judge stands and when decisions are about to be rendered. Where. And you'll be amazed how students think of judges. They often will not think of them in the liberal conservatives. They'll think typically in the political yeah, party. Yeah. I think the danger with that in terms of allowing... Which is what Inusa was about. Right, that's, that's the danger of the... Nice, nice right. the well, was that, that's the danger of the democratization, <laughs> you know. When we do that, then we're going to get to a point where we must have political representation on the... the no, I, 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 again, I understand. I know that you're not strictly speaking mm -hmm. of political election, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying if you speak of democratization, because democratization speaks of representation of so certain constituents. Mm -hmm. But that's what the problem is. In other words, I'm on the Supreme but Court. But you, you've made a point. In Ghana, those constraints are only two. They are only NDC or NDC. Right, they are only two, and often people don't put them in conservative and liberal. Yeah. People put them in NDC and NDC. And so to avoid these, I will still think that given our level of, if you like, for want of a better word, immaturity at this stage, we are not that, le that matured as a democracy. We are still growing. Uh, given that level <coughs> of growth at this stage, I will still Too think. Too early? I, I think at this stage we should still maintain that semblance that semblance of all the judges not being known. Uh, even though I guarantee that among the political players, uh, they, they have know. a way. They have, well, they whether are, they know they said or not. They've already done analysis. Well, I, don't, I, don't I don't know whether they know, but they have a way of telling you yeah. that X, and it's usually on the basis of appointment. They, you know, they just pigeonhole and, yeah. and people do that. But uh, uh, Atubuka has demonstrated that in True. his research. True. So, we True. Know. But, but, but my, my, my question to you, Mr. Fusin, is mm. of what benefit will that be to the greater good. Well, there's if, a lot of if, if we democratize and we know where your ideological well, leaders are. You see, are. there are a lot of jurisprudential questions now, even on judges. How do you, when there is a purely political decision, how do you allow people who are not elected to determine the political question? Mm. Okay, where do they derive their mandate from? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of issues about judges. That's why people are beginning to advocate for some level of democratization of the courts. Okay, so that you can always balance out. Mm. If not, you're going to have loop-sided judgments because the idiosyncrasies of the, of, the, of the judge... Influences the judgment? The idiosyncrasies of the judge is indeed the law. Mm, okay. okay, so, so, so mm. that is why we must, we must, we must. It's an interesting area. Yes. I mean, must. a judge in Ghana once said... Um, oh. is it, you know, but a judge in Ghana once said that he is going to decide cases on the basis of three things. Yeah. And uh, it's well done. The, <laughs> just keep my mind now. I'm sure yeah. he would remember the judge. But the judge said he would decide it on the basis of his knowledge of the law, no, yeah. his conscience, and his judicial oath. Mm. And I've always asked my students, what if the judge has knowledge of the law, has his judicial oath, but lacks conscience? conscience. Because conscience is not given unto everyone. Yeah. You know, yeah. in Ghana, we normally have the expression bad conscience, but I've always said there's nothing like bad conscience. You either have conscience or you lack one. Mm. And there are potentially judges who lack conscience. So if a judge is going to decide a case on the basis of his conscience, which doesn't exist, then you may potentially have a problem in that regard. It's, it feeds into what you're saying, that if you have a situation in which judges are going to give decisions on the basis of unverifiable factors, then potentially you may have like judges conscience. disguising uh, legal judgments, or rather political judgments, in the cloak of law. law, law yeah. But, and I understand my con your concern, my good friend, yeah. but the reality is this. At the moment, no country in the world has been able to find the best experimental way out of this. Mm. So, because constitutional cases in particular tend to be fundamentally and intrinsically political in character, judges almost invariably find themselves on the difficult end of the rope. Because regardless of the outcome of the case, the disaffected party or the disaffected political grouping will now start an investigation into who is this judge? Yeah. And that's where the problem starts. Then they'll say, okay, who's this judge? Who appointed him? And then let's do a little intrinsic analysis of his trend of decision making. 
invariably they will find a certain trend analysis that points in the direction for which they can now come out and say they don't like this. Yeah. And let's be honest, in the case of Ghana, both the NDC and the MPP How have had so? these, you know, these in, critical In fact, there's some who suggest that the current controversy we started the show with is at the, at the base of that is that suspicion. No, 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 that no. He is, let me, he, let he me is demonstrate to MPP. you that that cannot be the case. Because we have also looked at Duce's, Duce's judgments. And they're almost similar. Craig Luther, that's the guy. <laughs> <who> <laughs> they're, almost mean, I they're almost yeah. similar. They're almost similar to any of you So, I mean, it's not that, of, that, that, are that not options available. That probably was the line that knocked you out of the 2012 election. Well, I'm just saying that the 2016 election. Between Duce and any of there are no options available. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, 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 in fact, the basis of this present fracas between the uh, the minority and the majority yeah, yeah. is just procedure. Okay, it hasn't got to it has nothing to do with the judges. Okay, There's nothing, no, absolutely nothing. And I can tell you that because it's procedure, they should be able to find final, a solution. Final solution yeah. it, yeah. Because it hasn't got to the student of yeah, substance. Yeah, okay, yeah. so so final thoughts on on any nearby. Um If it can't be for the the house, for the feeling I get from Minister is that it, he'll get a unanimous approval. Yes. Yes. Unless something happens in the procedure, you don't resolve the controversy and you boycott. I think that okay. I think that what is going to happen is that look, you see, vetting gives an opportunity for us to ask all the tough questions. Yeah, that you know, that we know. You satisfy yourself yeah. the curiosity. Yeah. Those yeah. who are not sure no, can yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. What should be, and we have just thirty minutes or one minute, so I'll share this. With, what should be his priority if he gets a nod? Now it looks like he will. I mean, what should be the thing, the number one thing that you think he should tackle immediately? Um, it's hard to pin something on one, but my deep feeling is that he is going to tackle legal education. Okay. I am working with him currently, you know, on something like that. We're, we're serving a committee together, and I know how passionate he is. He is extremely passionate about legal education and the state of things, as far as legal education is concerned. So he's extremely quality, um, uh, quality assurance oriented, as far as legal education is concerned, and have a feeling that from the standpoint of legal education, it's going to be one of his first priorities. Mm. I think also that you know issues of practice, issues that relate to practice, uh, both you know I'm talking about both in the chamber, the Supreme Court chamber itself, and general practice are going to engage his attention. But listening to him generally, and um, the fact that he appears to be a person who who is uh, yearning, you know, who has a certain pangs of hunger to to change things and the status quo and how some things are not at the level at which they have to be, I have a feeling that general reform is going to engage his attention. Okay, Amy, so you agree I, I just think that general legal reform should be a low hunger food, food for him. You should, 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 should go after that one. I think there's a popular and support yes, for yes, that right yes, now. Yes, and he will endear himself yes, to the yes, general so, public. Mm, Immediately he does that yeah, and changes it. I yeah, mean, yeah. that was the biggest criticism against the outgoing CJ, by mm. the way. That's, that's a conversation for another day. Um, we have to look at his, her legacy as she steps out of the scene. But as a... Ordinary passing, mere mortal. I think one of the things he needs to do is to stop the judges from wearing wigs. I mean, for me, <laughs> I, I simply don't get it. In this climate, goodness me, if you can change that. But you say he's conservative too, so I'm not sure whether that's one of those things he wants to keep. But certainly, please stop wearing the wigs. If you can do that, I'll be happy. Do you think he will do that? Stop wearing the wigs? Yes. I will just leave it at saying that he is very particular about professional propriety, oh, as I mentioned. Oh, so we'll see. I, mean, that's I, I, can't, I can't predict. I that's don't know. No. I can't see. We'll see. <laughs> but that, that's, a for, that's a for tonight's edition. Uh, we watch how this unfolds. I beg of you, parliamentarians, in the national interest, find some consensus around this. At all, look at substance of the and simply Grill him. Throw him into the fire if you want. That's all we want. Let's see what we're doing.